All right, let's get into Built Different, part four. I'm putting my pastoral hat on in these messages, wanting us to walk in the victory that Jesus promises us, and then he teaches us how to walk in that victory through his word. Ephesians 6 says, for our struggle, and we recognized last week that we all struggle. The struggle is real. But there's probably a certain struggle right now in your life where he is trying to distract you more than any other area. And so we don't want to just be people that do a general Jesus be the Lord of my life. But Jesus be the Lord of my life in those areas where I'm tempted with sin. Like that's hard to process through to victory. You know, Michael Jordan uh, one of the greatest basketball players ever, known for his discipline, showing up at the gym early, staying late, you know, given to being at his best. Yet in other areas of his life, if you read or watch uh, the story of his life, there are other areas where he was completely undisciplined and indulgent. You take a look at Tiger Woods, so disciplined to the game of golf and has just been at the highest level of achievement and he's known for how careful he is to practice every day and all you know yet in other areas of his life we watch him go into rehabilitation for sex addiction so there's no discipline there's indulgence Tom Brady touted as the greatest quarterback of all time yet when his football career ends so does his marriage so this man known for such discipline and given to being at his best as a quarterback, yet has another area of his life that's completely out of control. And I just think that's a good reminder to us that I'm, I'm not talking about today those areas where we've got it on lock. Let's allow the Holy Spirit to deal with us about our struggle. Amen? so that he can be Lord of every area of my heart. Lord, be, come take your place, is what we just sang, and come take your place in that area of my life where I know I'm struggling. Are you with me today? Can we grow together? Come on, God loves you. I love you. And, and let's just press our hearts into this. Here's what James says. Each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Let's talk about how temptation works. Last week I told you that John Mark Comer has identified the work of the world flesh and the devil in these ways. Temptation starts with a, de a deceptive idea. It's a lie that can come to us as though it's true. Or it's something that will destroy, but it, it comes to us as something that would be very gratifying. So it's deceptive. That lands on a disordered desire. We're all growing. We all have our struggles. And so that lie will land in that area of your struggle. And that all happens in a world that basically says, go for it. This world has normalize sin and even affirms it and says you deserve it and do what do what you want to do so that unholy trinity has got to be met with some significant power that's greater than those things that we're up against someone else wrote many years ago and i think it helps us to understand temptation it starts with a thought that leads to nurturing that thought called imagination or fantasy. Then we start justifying. Samson felt like he deserved to do what he did and that he wanted to do it and so he did it and he destroyed his life. So he justified it, then he made a choice and when you make the choice, that's when the sin occurs. Fundamental to this teaching on temptation is to know temptation is not sin. It's what we do with it. And if we nurture the thought, 
start justifying, then we will start making choices. I got a struggle going on in my life right now. Uh, and I, I will tell you how my mind is working. This time of year, I'm really working on the vision for 2024. And with the Early Learning Center, the school, the church, there's a lot going on. And I do a five or six hour deep dive in, in prayer and thinking, how do we go forward? There are times that I come out of that and I feel like God has spoken and I, I have some answers and I'm excited. And about 9.30 at night, I'm so excited, I eat everything that's unhealthy for me. <laughs> there are times where I spend that same focus and I end up with more questions than I have answers. I'm frustrated and I'm so frustrated about 9.30, I eat everything <laughs> that is unhealthy for me. Now we're like, but I'm telling you, I'm crossing the line. It's wrong. I know for me, I know for me, because every time I do that, I'm not hungry. It's emotional. It's gratifying. So here I go. I, I think, you know, I deserve this thought, thought. You could have this right now, thought. Now, and I know exactly what I would get. And we, I, I will down that pizza. Whoa, extra cheese. Ex then after I've justified it because I'm frustrated or I'm, I'm excited, I make the choice and I hit Uber Eats. <laughs> and when, when I go to place that order, isn't it interesting? Uh, I, just full disclosure, there's one place that has these cheddar biscuits. And when you place your order, one comes with it. But then very strategically, it'll come up and says, often ordered with this will be extra biscuits, six of them. Absolutely, send them. I, I know the Lord would have me. And I'm, I'm telling you, that's my struggle. Right now, right now in my life, right now, it's wrong. It's wrong. And what is beneath that emotion, what, what's beneath emotional, because I'm not hungry. The different, and, and then after I do that, I feel horrible physically. I know I shouldn't have done it. Spirit, it's just wrong for me. So I gratified the flesh. Where am I not allowing the true and lasting satisfaction of Jesus to show up instead of me gratifying in that moment? Here's some good news. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man, and God is faithful. Say amen right there. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Doesn't become easy, but you can persevere through it by the help of God in that moment. So the question is, does James give us a sense of strategy? And he does. James 4, 7 tells us to submit and resist. He says, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. When I am hit with a thought that wants to be thought that leads to thinking how great it would be, then justification and choice, I first think I need to fight back. The word says, don't start with resistance, start with submission. Don't start with resisting the devil, start with submitting to God. Because I don't have the power within me to resist the devil, I need the help of God, so I submit to God first. Every temptation, is an opportunity to submit to God. Every one of them. How do you submit to God? Let's bring that to, to working for us on a Monday or a Tuesday for me at 9.30. Let, let's bring it there. Here we go. Craig Rochelle says he prays this every day, and I thought it applies perfectly to how to submit to God. He said, I pray God today guard my thoughts 
and let my thoughts honor you. So I'm going to be careful with every thought. Number two, God has set a covenant concerning my eyes. Then, Lord, I want you to guard my words. I want my words to honor you. I will not be critical, and I will intentionally be positive. I don't want my words to be coarse. I want them to be clean. God, I bring my hands to you. I'm working hard, and I want to honor you with my work. I want to advance the vision that you've given me. And so, Lord, I submit my hands to you. I'm submitting my vision to you. I'm submitting this day of work to you. God, I give you my feet. I will stand in your power. I will move forward in step with you. I will walk in ordered steps in Jesus' name. And when I read of his prayer and listened to him talk about that, I thought, that's how we submit to God. I don't want to stand here and say, submit to God. And it's like, but how do we really do that? We're putting on the armor of God. Start with my thoughts. Helmet of salvation. I need to guard the way I think. That's where the battle starts. Then I want to say, Lord, even my words, my eyes, my hands, my feet, I get clothed in the armor of God. Now I've submitted to God. I'm empowered then to resist the devil. I'm going to take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now I'm ready to resist. Submit to God. I think you can do that throughout the day. Every day. That works in the moment. Let's press it a little bit deeper. Submitting to God is with your life, with consistency, and over time you are cultivating the fruit of the Spirit. Submitting to God automatically means I'm crucifying the flesh. I am growing the fruit of the Spirit, the last being the fierce fruit of self-control. So submitting to God in the moment means about my immediate thoughts, what I'm watching, what I'm saying, what I'm doing, where I'm going. And then in the process of discipleship, it is about the formation of godly character that is taking on not self-control that I came up with, God gives me control because he is growing in my life. The spirit is at work over time. And now I'm taking on an authority that comes from God. And my no can be no. And my yes can be yes. And I can walk in the freedom that God has for me. Resist. Do you see where, once again, we are back at this central place that you have to love Jesus for any of this to work. Like it can't be a religious relationship. You got to be engaged with your heart. Because if I want Jesus to help me with what I'm, my struggle right now, it has to be authentic. It's got to be an authentic desire. It can't be, Lord, you're going to help me tonight at 930 when I want to order everything that's not good for me. You're going to help me, but don't help me, but just so much because I'm still going to do it. I really want to do it. Like, I, I want your help, but not really. As long as we're there, it is telling us we're really not submitting to God. We, we, we're enjoying the sin. We're still preferring that momentary gratification. Even though we know it leads to regret and guilt and shame and sin, bottom line, We're going for it. And so I would encourage us to just say submitting, submitting, look look at that word, submit, come under, surrender. Like I want to honor you, Lord. You start there. When I give the altar call today, it's not to come and focus on that struggle. It's will you submit to God? Because if I submit to God, that is going to be the power out of that relationship to resist. A couple of weeks ago, I talked about identity resistance. When you're walking with God, you are reminded of who you are in God. And it means something. James Clear in his book, Atomic Habits, he did the work in chapter two on this 
difference between uh, this I can't do it versus I don't do it. And a person who's trying to break the habit of smoking, if they say to someone, hey, you want to smoke? No, I can't do that anymore. You're focused on that behavior that you can't do. And so they're seeing that the success rate is very low. But the person who says, I don't do that anymore, that's not who I am, is showing a great success rate. Well, apply the word of God to that principle. You are the son of God. You're the daughter of God. You're in relationship with Jesus. And when that matters to you, it matters to you that you, you are a disciple and you're walking, nurturing a heart of greater love for Jesus then out of who you are, you will say, I don't do that anymore. See, here's what I know about my struggle. I will never change by just looking at the behavior. Until I change my mindset. See, this isn't about exactly what I'm doing. There's always something deeper. And God doesn't want us just to address Symptoms. We're not taking the sword of the Spirit, the Word which is a double-edged sword, and chopping at the fruit today. We want to chop at the root. Why am I doing that? Why am I eating emotionally? What's, what's beneath that? Is it just simply because I love it? Or is there something deeper? And when you press into who you are, and you work on the deep allegiance of your soul to Jesus. You work on true surrender to Jesus. Something begins to happen from the inside out. And you find yourself saying, that's not who I am. I'm not going to do that because it's not who I am. Submit, then you're ready to resist. Let's talk about resistance now. Resistance to me, it, it, it would start right here. Christ in me is greater than the desires in me. Say it like this. Christ in me is greater than the disordered desires in me. Do you believe that? <clears throat> when you're walking in that growing relationship with Jesus, then you pick up a faith in God, not in yourself but a faith in God that you can overcome. You don't have to continue that pattern because Christ in you is greater than the disordered desires in you. We want to honor Jesus. So here would be the next, to me, one of the best practices. When it comes to resisting temptation, why not try to eliminate it whenever you can? If I know going to a certain place makes it easier to sin, I can change that. If I know being around certain people makes it easier to sin, I can change that. So you can't eliminate temptation, but there are some places you can eliminate it. You, you can cut it off. So why not seeing the best resistance? Why would I want to position myself to have to resist something that I can eliminate. Can't eliminate all temptation, but a lot of it you can. And out of my relationship with Jesus, I'll get so radical that I will draw that line. Here's what Solomon said to his son. Do not set foot on the path of the wicked or walk in the way of evildoers. Watch this. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn from it and go on your way. Your way, he's speaking, of, you know the way. It's the right way, so avoid the other way. He's saying, son, there are places where you can make choices where you won't even have to resist because you've eliminated the potential. Well, that, that should help somebody right there. See, if you really want to overcome, you say, here's my struggle, here it is, Right now in my life, this is the primary struggle. Is there any place where you could draw a line and control your environment and make it as hard for the enemy 
as possible. Oh, thank you, Jesus, that this is a plan to overcoming. Removing the potential of temptation where you can is resisting temptation. Hmm. Here's my question. Is there a recurring temptation that you need God's help to overcome? I've told you mine. Secondly, is there something you can do to create distance or even eliminate the possibility? And the reason I would be interested in trying to follow through on doing that is because I'm submitting to God the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I felt to tell you that God wants your temptation to become a testimony. I felt to say that to you today. We all need to hear it, but somebody needs to hear that. God wants to take your temptation and turn it into a testimony. Romans 8 says that he's made you more than a conqueror. How are you more, like if you've conquered, how are you more than a conqueror? Because when God has given you help because you've submitted to him and he's helped you to conquer that struggle, there will come a day where you will speak into someone's life who's struggling the way you used to. And you will use your story of submitting to God and resisting and overcoming that to help them start a path of victory. And when you take your temptation and you overcome, and then you help somebody else overcome, that's when you're more than a conqueror. And that's when your temptation has turned into a testimony. And that's what it should be about. That's what it should be about. All of us in here have our issues, our struggles, and we are when we're willing to lower defenses or, or trying to save face or just pose and say, yeah, me too, I've got a struggle too. And we submit to God and we walk into love for Jesus as his disciple, as his apprentice, and spiritual formation happens, then you walk in victory. And that victory turns into your testimony and you live with the victory of being more than a conqueror. God wanted me to tell somebody, your temptation can be turned into a testimony. As the worship team comes today, I want to ask you again, will you capture a vision today of walking in freedom? Will you capture a vision of, of being that person having conquered that struggle and then helping other people can you capture that compelling vision? And if you are willing to, here's the altar call. Not to come and bring that struggle. Come and bring yourself in submission to God. Why? Because that's what James says to do. Submit to God. Then you will discover the power to resist. God wants you to know freedom. God wants you to know victory. It may have been years. You may have prayed about this more times than you can count. Pray again. Respond to God again. Know that God has better for you. God doesn't want you locked down in that sin pattern. This is your day. Temptation becomes a testimony. Standing with me, everybody. Worship team, come out and join me. And as they do, the altar call is to say, you are the Lord. You are the Lord of my life. This is the song that I believe the Holy Spirit is singing over us. I believe that churches get into seasons and the Holy Spirit is singing something over the church. And when we discern that and we start singing it, it's like praying for rain in the time of rain. It's like aligning with what God is doing and, and you step into where God is working and it's not, Lord, would you bless me? Lord, I want to step into what you're blessing and the blessing of God is on lordship.
come under. You are the Lord, the Lord of my life. Can you say that today? Bring, bring those struggles in, not, not you're the Lord of all of these and you know I'm just human and you justify that, that category. Bring the struggle, bring it all. He loves you, he's for you, and he wants to help you. Do not be like Samson who said, I want it, I deserve it, I can handle it. And he destroyed his life. I speak to people in all phases and stages. Some of you find yourself in the grip. You've crossed that line. You need God's help today. He's going to help you. Some of you, you're taking steps in the wrong direction. Your life has not been destroyed. You're taking steps from Samson's hometown to Timnah, where when he went to Timnah, a place he should not have gone, ended up with someone he shouldn't have been with, and destroyed his life. It was 25 miles. So mile one, he hasn't destroyed his life. Mile two, he hasn't destroyed his life. But he needed to get a new course. He needed to hear Solomon say, like, turn, avoid, walk in a different path. But step by step, step by step. So some people, you're, you're dealing with the full consequences. Let's find God's grace, God's mercy, God's healing, and go forward. If you're stepping and you're tampering, you're kind of playing with sin, you're playing the middle, you're taking steps, let this old guy say, stop! It'll destroy you. See it for what it is. Stop today. Stop. Turn. Turn from it. Get on a different path. Come on. God loves you. God's for you. He's like, do you realize God could have set up this entire service? Because he wants to help somebody who's really struggling. Like, does God want to help me? He set this entire service up as a way to say he loves you, he's for you, and he's going to help you. Oh, this, I, I feel victory in this room right now. There's a victory in this place right now. And all you have to do is step into it. Align with the Lordship of Jesus Christ.